<laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Thanks for being here. I wonder sometimes why you keep coming back, but you're here, and so that's good. Uh, no updates on anything today, so let's go straight to the sermon. Uh, last week, uh, we read about Paul preaching so long that a guy fell asleep and fell out the window and died. Uh, and yet God was faithful and raised that man, that boy, uh, up from the dead. And then everybody went back inside and like good Christians had a meal uh, and kept talking about the good news until morning, daybreak. Then Luke and some of the other people caught a ship to a city named Asos. Uh, and just a note here, uh, this passage was so confusing for me that if you have your bulletin, I printed you a map, uh, and you can find a sos on there where they started, and then just follow the lines, and uh, you can uh, see all of these places, and I will screw up the names big time, just so you know. Uh, for some reason, Paul didn't go with that group on the boat. He decided to go by land uh, through uh, Macedonia. Uh, through Greece. They were already in Greece. So you can see that one. He goes all the way up around there. That's number seven, way up there. Um, this has got to take some time. He's either riding in a chariot or walking. Uh, they're going by boat. So they'll get there before he does. Um, and uh, so he got, uh, he had his, made it up his mind that he was going to go by land and he met them at Asos. Uh, where he got on board and the boat, and they went to Mytilene. And then from there, the following day, they uh, went to Chios, and the next day at Samos, and the day after, they went to Miletus. You know, why does he have to tell us all that detail? I have no idea, but that's what God had in his word, wanted in his word. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment, imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Oh, that you and I would begin to think and live like Paul. It, it's my prayer that God would give me the strength in relation to you guys not to shrink back uh, from declaring anything that is profitable to you. I beg God to let me give you what you need to make it through this life, this day-to-day craziness that is the 21st century. Um, I struggle from week to week trying to figure out where God is leading us, what he is doing, or at least what he wants to, to do. I try to listen and be constrained by the Spirit to know what he wants from us. I'm not necessarily successful at it, but I try. Because I believe that he still speaks today, and I believe that he wants to lead us and guide us in every area of our lives. But like I said, it's hard. It's kind of like listening to, uh, trying to watch the Cardinals play baseball on television when you don't have cable. It's not possible. Okay? Baseball doesn't come on antenna TV anymore. It just doesn't. It doesn't come on FM radio. 
anymore. If you're lucky, you can pick up St. Louis on the AM radio, but not during the day. Then only in your car and if you hold your mouth right. Okay? It's real frustrating. It reminds me of a line from another Tom Petty song. I, I, I don't know why they always come to me for sermons, but the song was The Last DJ. And it says, as we uh, celebrate mediocrity, all the boys up want, upstairs want to see is how much you'll pay for what you used to get for free, right? You could watch baseball all day long in the old days. Listen to it on, any ra- on the radio all the time for free. Not anymore. Anyway, that's how frustrating it is for me trying to hear what the Spirit is saying. You got to find that right frequency. You got to find out where it is on the dial and you got to search it out. It's there, but you have to tune into it. Um, You know, maybe it becomes easier with practice. I don't know. I wish it was clearer, but it's not. But just because it's difficult is no excuse not to listen or obey. We must beg God to give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us so that we might know, like Paul, whether to go by boat or by land. God wanted him to go by land. I have no idea why. And Paul, of course, doesn't tell us. Right? Um, You know, that's not something that we're used to doing, and that reflects just how far away our Christianity is away from Paul's Christianity. In the last few years, I can relate to verse 24 more and more. Paul says, but I do not account my life of any value or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I find my heart gradually moving in that direction. I find that I am more and more constrained to do just that. I am less inclined to seek a name for myself, less inclined to come up with new schemes to make it in the world. I know that God has called me here for the long term and that it's going to cost me my whole life. Um... And as I look back, I can see in the rubble of my past the hand of God bringing me here and bringing you here for such a time as this. Like Paul, I feel constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me or us here. Yet the Holy Spirit seems to be testifying to me regularly that something good is waiting for us to find it. I have hope because of what I see God doing in some of your lives. I see people recognizing their sins and in their lives and confessing to those who are wrong. That's a blessing. I see me doing the same thing. I see hope where I couldn't see hope before. I'm being driven to continue to write and press into the scriptures in new and scary ways. I notice the fruit of the Spirit growing in my life and in yours in greater abundance. God is doing a new thing in our midst. It may not be tangible enough for everyone to see it, but I am reminded of it daily. Anyway, back in in verse 25, Paul continues, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. What a hard thing to have to say. We're never gonna see each other again. No telephones, you can't call me. You know, I, well, there's not going to be no more communication between us, more than likely. He just spent three years with these people. God has done amazing things, like raising people from the dead. And uh, Paul realizes that this is the last time he's going to see these people in this age. And there's certainly sorrow in that. And yet he is quick to add, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What he's saying to them is this. I told you the truth. I made the good news very plain to you. If you refuse to believe it, that's not my fault. 
That's what he's saying. Uh, your unbelief is your problem. You need to take care of that with God. I think in our day and age, we've been made to feel guilty about the lost. But the truth is, saving people is not our job. Proclaiming the truth that Jesus is Lord and that a person must submit to his lordship, that is what we have to be faithful in. God has to change hearts and people have to humble themselves before him. Knowing does not save you. Knowing does not save you. The only thing that saves you is humbling yourself before God and saying, have mercy on me, I am a sinner. I am in rebellion against you. Paul goes on and says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which is, he obtained with his own blood. Because I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. From my perspective, I think that the church as a whole in our day and age has already been ravaged by fierce wolves and I think it's been going on for centuries. The flock of God has not been spared at all. What we call faith today is more like an educational process than it is salvation. If you know the right things, you're going to be okay, but that's not the gospel. The good news of Jesus isn't something you learn up here. It's something that happens to you, and when it happens, it begins to transform you from the inside out. It transforms your character, not just your mind. It transforms how you live your daily life, and it brings an end step by step to the rebellion that is in your heart. The gospel is costly and deadly. If it is not costly and deadly, it is not the gospel. It's something else. The goal of the good news of Jesus is to be killing you softly with its song. If you're not dying to yourself and your ways over time, you are not being saved. And I say that to myself as much as I say it to any of you. I know that some of you are starting to fear, to experience just how frightening and difficult dying to yourself is. It makes you want to turn and run and go back towards death because it's such a scary thing. And I beg you not to do it. Stand firm. Die like a child of God. Be a martyr. Not to the enemies that around you, but to the enemy that's in your heart, your own self-will. Trust that he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, even though it hurts like hell. Because it is a bit of hell that is in your heart, and it's getting ripped out of you and ripped away from your life. You see, unbelief, which is rebellion, is the essence of what hell is. Dying to that hurts worse than anything you will ever have to do. Trust me, I'm learning from experience that is not just empty words. I would much have rather to die when I was 21 and go straight to heaven than I would have to live through dying to myself and living to be 59. But God, I would have missed out on all of this joy though. This joy, this goodness that I now see is life is full of if you die to yourself. The goodness of God is everywhere to be seen everywhere, but we can't see it because we're focused on death. When, when, when we get new eye implants and we begin to see the world the way God sees the world, you see his glory everywhere. 
and you see how dark the church is, but you also see how dark, how, how hopeful the future is when God begins to bring people once again to repentance like they've never seen before. Not our parents, nor our grandparents, or our great-grandparents, and you can go back for 500 years and say they haven't seen it yet. You can go back for 1,500 or almost 2,000 years and say they haven't seen it. They haven't seen it since the second century. That's how long the church has been taken captive. There's coming a day when that first and second century will be lived out again, not the way they did it, but in a new unfolding of what God wants to do in the 21st or maybe the 22nd century. But he's coming. It's going to happen. And he's using us to prepare the way. I do not know how and I don't know why, but I know he is. Uh, back in verse 31, Paul says, therefore, because the wolves are coming, be alert, remembering for three years that I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you inheritance among those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands have ministered to my necessities and those who are with me in all things. I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Oh, that you would see that in me. Not that I never failed, but when I crashed and burned in your presence, God convicted me of it. And oftentimes I repented with tears. And the, the last 12 years have turned my life upside down. They have brought me to repentance over and over and over again. And if you get nothing out of what I say week in and week out, I pray that you get something from how I live before you. I'm anything but perfect, yet, God, yet when God finally gets through my hard head and heart and pierces it, I'm usually quick to repent. Not always, but usually. It is my only hope, and I try to model that for you. Back in verse 36, when he said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Moving on to chapter 21, we read, and when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by straight course to Kaz, and then to Rhodes, and from there to Patra, and having found a ship, we crossed to Phoenicia. We went aboard and set sail. We had come inside of Cyprus, leaving it on the left. We sailed to Syria and then Syria. You know, that's where we're having the war now. That's, he was there. Uh, and landed in Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Uh, these types of things are what we've been not taught to not believe in in our age. But as you walk humbly with God, he will begin to speak to you by his spirit. Here the whole group of these believers uh, in this town were hearing the same thing. If Paul goes to Jerusalem, bad things are going to happen to him. That's what they're hearing. Okay. Now, you know, I'm not sure that the Spirit was telling them that Paul was, uh, wasn't supposed to go to Jerusalem. You know, they didn't want him to go to Jerusalem. That's the important po point, because if that's what the Spirit was saying, don't go to Jerusalem, then Paul didn't pay any attention to them. And he didn't pay any attention to the Holy Spirit. And Paul was being disobedient. Uh, what they were doing, what they were being told or shown, we don't know how the Spirit was communicating to them. Uh, but what they were told, what they figured out was it was not going to be a pleasant experience for Paul if he went to Jerusalem, and they wanted to spare him that. There was going to be trouble. I know my own response to potential trouble most of my life has been to run the other way, and, and that has been slowly changing over the last 30 years, that trouble is not our enemy. We need to understand that. Um, 
us doing our own will, me refusing to go where God tells me to go, is always the enemy. Back in the text, after they spent a week with these people, Luke writes, we departed and went on our journey. They, all with their wives and children, accompanied us till we were outside the city. And then we knelt down on the beach and we prayed and said farewell to one another. And then we went on board our ship and they went home. Life goes on. I pray that God would continually pour out his spirit upon you daily and that you would begin to see your life, see life in your everyday existence where there used to be death and that your latter days would be better than your former days. Let's pray. Oh, Father, have mercy on us. Thank you for being faithful in giving me the words to say today. Continue to clean out all of our ears that we might hear you better. Give us the will and the power to do what we hear. May your grace abound in every area of our lives. I ask this in the power and authority of Jesus, King of heaven and earth. Please make it so. Amen.